How can you build a simple simulation that shows the spread of a disease? Well, I had a go in stencil, and I'd like to show you how I made it. Now, a short while ago, I was asked to make a simulation that didn't really show how infections worked, but more how crowding into areas like restaurants or even into city centers is a good way of spreading a disease faster. So I built a simulation in Stencil that can show you how slowly an infection spreads when you've got less crowds, and at the same time can show you how crowding people into a small area will allow a disease to spread really fast. Now I chose Stencil to make this simulation because I think Stencil is really good at doing this kind of thing. Now before we go any further, let's make a quick note. I'm not doing this as a scientific study. I'm not using any kind of scientific data or any kind of numbers from official sources. This is just a simple simulation that shows you what happens when you put lots of people into one place and program it to spread an infection. So we'll get into how we actually do all the mechanics of that right now. Now to make this game or simulation, I simply made one scene and it's called L1, doesn't matter what it's called. I made this level 1200 by 800 pixels wide and tall. Now it doesn't really matter how big or how small you make the simulation, you've just got to remember how big you've actually made your screen. This was designed to put in a PowerPoint presentation, which is why I chose those dimensions. So I've got one level. Now I've also just imported one actor, I call this actor people, and this actor or this character has got two animations. One's simply a blue square, that's a normal person who's not infected, and the other animation is a red circle. So all I did was put in a red fill in a drawing program, exported two of those PNGs, and then imported that into one character as two animations. I named one blue and I named the other one red. Simple, simple, simple. Let's go to level one, and that's where all the action's going to take place. That's where our people are going to walk. And what I wanted to do was create a bunch of people. And to do that, it's really quite simple because I've already imported an actor. We can use the create actor block to just create actors on our levels. I've done that twice and I'll explain why. Let's just break this down into its normal parts like this. So the first bit of code is really simple. I've just said create an actor type. And then I chose the only actor that was there, that's people. And I've told Stencil to put it in a random place between the left and the right and the up and the down bounds of my level. So that's 50 and 1,150 and then 50 and 750. So I've basically put a 50 pixel border around my game for no reason, just because I did. And then as soon as that actor is created on the screen, because I'm paranoid about animations in Stencil, I've told it to switch the animation to blue for whichever the last created actor was. So when I put that into a repeat block and then put 100, let's change that to 10. When you put that into a repeat block, all that will happen is when the game's created, you're going to create 10 blue circles or 10 blue people, and that's it. And then I repeat exactly the same thing, which is create an actor type, which is the actor, again, randomly putting it, oh, and I noticed that I've got the wrong numbers here, so let's just change that so that's between 50 and 1,150, and that will be 50 and 750. So we've got it matching up to the last one. So we create just one actor, and now what we do is we switch the animation to red. So essentially in this simulation, we've got 10 uninfected people and one infected person, in the level and we just create them and that's all that we need in the events of the level create our actors and then do nothing else of course we can go back here and create a hundred or a thousand or a million people so once we change that number there that's how we simulate the overcrowding or the keeping your distance kind of part of the simulation now let's go to the people and let's have a look at the events because there's a few of them and they're not so hard to understand but we'll go through them really simply. What I first did was create two attributes. One was called X velocity and one was called Y velocity. I also experimented with a direction attribute, but I, I gave that up. So what I've done is just created an X velocity and a Y velocity and left them there. 
when the game is created, the actor is given a random X velocity and a random Y velocity. Now, the way I've done it is this. I've set up the X velocity to be a random number all the way from minus seven, which is going towards the left, all the way to seven, which is going to the right. The Y velocity, I've again set randomly from minus seven, which is going up. And remember, stencil minus Y is an upward direction and positive seven, so seven, and then your character will go down. So what happens is when an act is created at the start of the game, so every time one of those hundred or one of those thousand actors is created, they are randomly assigned a direction. So they'll either be going to the right, left, or up and down. And when you combine that, that movement is going anywhere, really, and at a number of different speeds. So some will be going really fast, and some will be going really slow. In fact, you can actually have a character at zero, zero, meaning that they'll just stand still. And that's what we do. So no matter how many actors are created, they all get a random velocity, X and Y, to travel on. And that's it. Now let's have a look at the actual movement. When the game is created and when it's running, you always set the X speed of your character to X vel, the attribute, and Y speed is set to Y vel. So that's a really simple thing to understand. Each actor gets a random X and Y velocity. And then we have told it in this code, basically, as soon as the act is created, set your velocity to whatever that random number that was generated and stick to it. Don't change it no matter what. We've also got a bouncing code, and that's when our characters reach the end of a screen, whether it's left, right, or up or down. And we want our characters to bounce. Again, we didn't have to do that. We could just have characters going off the screen. But for this simulation, I just wanted that feeling of people walking around, going in and out of shops, and just basically, you know, a crowd of people going about their business. So what I did here was really simple. I checked the X position of the actor. So that's, remember, we're in people. So I'm checking the X position of self. And in this case, I'm saying, if this actor ever goes past 1,150, that's all the way to the right of the screen, 50 pixels left over, of course. And then what I've said is, set the X of the X of self. So check the position that you're in and minus five. So let's just do this really logically, our character's moving to the right, so it's reached the position 1,150. As soon as it reaches there, it bounces back minus five. And there's a reason for that, and I'll explain it in a second, because once you bounce that character back, you then set the X velocity to whatever the X velocity was, and then times it by minus one, and that's a reversal. So if your X velocity is seven, you're going really fast towards the right, you hit the right hand wall, you bounce back five pixels and immediately your velocity is now minus seven. So you're traveling to the left. Now, what I've noticed in a lot of programming environments is when a character goes to the edge of the screen, they sometimes get caught in what I call a vibration loop. So they kind of go right, left, right, left, and they just vibrate at that side position. Now, the other three are exactly the same. All we're doing is checking the left hand side. So if you go less than 50, it's the same thing. This time around, we bounce you back in. So you have to get plus five. And the same for Y, we bounce you up and down and then always reverse the velocity. So if you're going up, you're going down. If you're going left, you're going right. And in that way, we get this really cool bouncing motion where they just bounce off the walls and then travel in the opposite direction that they were. So that's really simple. We don't even have to touch that code anymore. I didn't program any interaction between people. So if a person hits a person, they just barge past that person and continue in the direction that they were going. Again, you could very easily simulate a person hitting another person and then having to randomly go in a different direction. For this simulation, I chose that it was kind of that, you know, Christmas shopping kind of crowd where they just walk in a straight line and if you get in their way, your rugby tackled out of the way and they continue to walk. So I really wanted to simulate a real crowd of, you know, almost aggressive people just walking in the direction they want to. Again, everything's possible. You can program anything like random movements or people stopping or anything like that. But for this one, I needed to keep it simple. Now let's talk about the most important part of the code, which is the collision to infection, which I love that title. So when a collision happens, we need to figure out whether one of our people is infected. And if one of our people is infected, they have to infect the other person. 
That sounds kind of complicated. And I have to admit, it took me hours to get this right, mainly because I don't deal in this kind of programming or simulation work. But anyway, let's get to it. What I ended up doing was choosing a collision which was a actor of type, which is one of these. So that's when an actor self hits an actor type and then you have to choose what style of actor or which actor you're going to hit. So that's the one that I did. So I found it worked absolutely brilliantly. And that's here. So when self, so when a person hits a person or people, so that's when any one of those blue dots hits any one of those blue dots. And then again, we have this weird first actor, actor of type. That doesn't mean much when you're normally doing a collision between you and a baddie. But in this case, because we've created our people automatically, 10 or 100 or 1,000, we have to now start using these. So let's break this down. What we're doing in this collision is saying, when I, that's a blue person, hits another person, and that's it. So we're just checking if two people are hitting each other yet. We then put in an if, and this is really important, because what we need to do next is check, is the person I'm hitting red or blue? Well, in this case, if a blue person hits a blue person, nothing happens because we haven't programmed anything. So blue and blue, they just hit each other and nothing happens. But if the current animation for actor type, now this is really important. I'm just going to throw that away so you can see actually where it comes from. If the current animation for actor, now that doesn't make any sense. Which actor are we talking about? There's 11 of them on the screen. Is it the last created actor? Well, that doesn't make sense because you have no idea out of the 11 or the 100 or the 1000, which one of them was the last created actor? Last collided actor. Again, they're all hitting each other. So you don't know which one is the last collided actor. I didn't set up an attribute and I can't choose self because I'm the one that's checking if I'm hitting other people. So I can't be checking a collision on myself. So we're kind of stuck there. So what we do is we pick that up, that actor of type, we pick it up and we put it there in the place of the other choices we have. So if me, that's, I'm, I'm now talking about self here. If I happen to hit another circle, another person, I want to check if the current animation for that actor, the actor of type, the person I'm hitting, is the animation red. And if that's the case, then switch the animation for red for the first actor. So remember, when you have a collision, you've got a first actor and another actor. So that's first actor, second actor. I wish actually they had just called it second actor because it doesn't make much sense when you write it like that. But when the first actor hits the second actor, check the second actor and see if they're red or blue. If they're red, then change yourself, that's myself, to red as well. And that's how we spread the infection. Check when you hit another person, is that person red? And if that person's red, then turn me red as well. And that should work really well. So let's just check that out. Okay, now we have it running. You can see now, again, this simulation I'm making, it wasn't a scientific study. So it wasn't like I was asked to make this for a bunch of doctors. It was really just a presentation about let's keep some distance between each other and you can see how safe we are. Now here you can see in the simulation, all the points I've talked about are working here. Some of our actors, like this fellow over here, is walking really slowly. Practically no Y value and just minus X, something really small like minus one on the X. You can see we've got a slightly faster one. That one looks like a, you know, a five and a five. So that it's moving in a diagonal line. Now you can see we've got two infections and that's about 10 or 15 seconds later. That's our third infection over there. In the simulation, you can also say, well, okay, every 10 seconds is one day or every 20 seconds is one day. And again, that simulation will show you, okay, so if we carry on like this, how fast will the infection spread? Now let's just change our numbers so that we can make it a little bit more interesting. Let's put this at 200. So let's crowd the same place with a whole bunch of people and see what happens. As you can see right now, way too crowded. Everyone's bumping into everyone. And what you should spot immediately is that this infection is spreading amazingly fast. And that's kind of logical because everyone's crowded together. Every infected person is touching someone and infecting them. And if, if we did do that same kind of thought process where 10 seconds or 20 seconds was one day, then you can see how much faster infections go 
when you have a crowd of people all bumping into each other, sitting close to each other, not distancing themselves. To the first example we had when we actually had a bit of distance and that infection rate was much slower. So I hope you enjoy that. I know it's a bit different to use Stencil for these things, but Stencil is really good at programming this stuff. And hopefully some of the stuff I've done today might help you out designing a game with zombie swarms or attack of baddies like spaceships and aliens all coming in at once so that you know that you don't have to create them one by one. You can have the programming creating hundreds if not thousands of baddies or characters on the screen and then using that really cool collision trick to make sure that you know who's hitting who and what's hitting what. So hope to see you next time for my next video. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you learned something. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. Think about clicking that like button subscribe to the channel if you want to keep up and maybe think about hitting the bell notifications if you want to be notified every time a new video comes up.